Uh, awesome. So, uh, very excited to have you. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, so, you are, uh, you know, obviously a little bit of a legend uh, in this in this community. I mean, I don't know if you like wake up in the morning thinking you're a legend, but you know, you pretty much pretty much are. Um, and you know, you've inspired a lot of this, you know, here in New York and, and across the country. So. I want to do three things. I want to, you know, one, um, talk about your entrepreneurial journey because, uh, you know, just in case it's not obvious from the previous talk, it's as much an event about uh, entrepreneurship as it is about the, you know, specific um, sort of hardware and software world. Um, two, I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the market where you see trends, what's happening. Uh, and three, and perhaps more importantly, I want to give you guys plenty of time to um, ask uh, as many questions as, as you'd like. Um, so yeah, I'd love to start with your uh, entrepreneurial journey. And you have, you have this just amazing background, right, where uh, you were a public school arts teacher. Before that, you were in the movie world. So you know, typically not the type of background that one would necessarily associate to then become a very successful tech entrepreneur. So that, how, how did it all start? I'm just obstinate. And um, so like when I was in school, going to college at a liberal arts college, Evergreen State College in Washington State, I was lucky enough that I had an uncle who basically said, while you're in college, you're like not required to do anything, take whatever you want, follow your dreams. It's probably the only time in your life you're going to be able to do that, so go for it. And so I studied political science, I studied education, cognitive theory, mythology, and then I ended up landing into ethnomusicology and joining a samba band and gamelan band for the last two years and doing buto dance, which is basically you shave off all your hair, paint yourself white, and drool publicly. Um, it's a very powerful post-war Japanese dance form. It's a little bit like fundraising as well, right? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then I had some time and ended up getting into puppetry. And through a number, through weird like connections, I was just asked if I wanted to go work on a puppet movie. And I said yes. And then it turned out like it was Pinocchio with Martin Lando, Landau. And, and, and then it was like, and is it OK if, if the job is in Prague? And I was like, yes. And I was so naive. I was like, what country is Prague in? This is like an American 18, like 21 year old, right? So I figured that out um, and uh, went there and ended up making tea for the best people in animatronics and doing a bunch of work for Jim Henson's Creature Shop, mostly making tea, which it turns out like if you're looking for an inn with a British crew, like make tea. They'll, like, it, it pained them so much to have an American making tea for them. <laughs> the people who are laughing are the people who know British people. And, um, and then I ended up going back, to get it basically like burning out. Because like, I don't know if you've ever done film work, but it was like on location, six day weeks, 16 hour days, and then you go and you drink. And that, that's the yeah, pro tip, like if you're in a business and everybody's going to go out for dinner, and probably drink, like go, even if you don't drink, go, because that's like, in film, it was so awesome to see money versus art every night at dinner over drinks. And it was like better the more drinks that had happened. The producer and the director would sit there and be, and the director would be like, I need six explosions tomorrow. And the producer would be like, well, what if you can only have three? And they'd be like, well, then you've ruined the whole movie. So being able to see the battle of, of art versus money is, um, was awesome. And it's just important to go out and like, if there's things to do after work, you have to do them if you want to be involved. So, so we all need to drink more. That's the, the first lesson of all of this. You know, I don't want anybody to become an alcoholic on my <laughs> behalf, but it's part of like, if you're going to be part of a creative culture, at least you don't have to drink. You can just go out and watch the fireworks. Um, and then, and then I became a school teacher. And basically, my life is dedicated to empowering people to be creative. And I did that in, as a school teacher. I did that as a videographer. And then I do that at MakerBot. So I would, my, my goal was to give students as many opportunities to express themselves, as many different ways to express themselves. Drawing, painting, ceramics. We, you know, we did every, I tried to teach them everything that I could to get them activated 
So what, what, what happened after that? So you, you so one of your founders was a rep rap uh, person. I mean, how, how did you connect with those people? How did it how did it start? So I was teaching, and then I ha I had this realization that if I made videos of myself teaching, my students paid better. I did, and I did the research. My students would pay more attention to me on video than me in person. <laughs> And so I was making all these tutorial videos in like 2003, 2004, 2005, early 2006. And then at some point I started putting them on, on the web, archive.org, and I was there for the blip.tv launch and uh, shocked by the YouTube launch. And, and so I was, I was like video blogger number 13, mostly just because I was like, you know, I make this stuff anyway, might as well publish it to the web. And then people started watching it. And I was like, whoa. 30,000 people watch this. That's like more than Mariners Stadium in 2005. That was kind of a big deal. Um, so I, started, I ended up making these videos and got, and Make Magazine was like, we like these videos. We'll post them. And at that point, Make Magazine had a top 50 blog because Phil Trone was running it. And uh, so they had like just massive, like people just, it was awesome, awesome community. And he, he called me up and said, he was in Seattle too. I was in Seattle at the time. He's like, if you make videos, I'll post them on my site and you'll get lots of traffic. And I was like, okay. I'm, and I just basically took, I just took on another full-time job. I would, I would teach from like seven to four and then edit and shoot, shoot and edit video from like four to midnight and then get, and then just started publishing every week and he would publish them on make and I'd be like, this is awesome. I have an audience. And then eventually they just had to hire me. I mean, I think that's one of the things about getting a job. Like, so many people like apply for jobs when you can really also just go out and just infiltrate organizations and start doing the jobs until they pay you. Yeah. <laughs> like really, how, like how many of you have gotten a job by doing it before, or, or a promotion by doing it before you got the title? Okay, I want to hire all of you. Um, yeah, game, right, for real. Like that's, those are the people who are going to get ahead. They're like, I'm going to do the thing that's going to get me ahead before I, before I get anything for it. And you can't do that for years because you'll just die of starvation. But um, yeah, so then I ended, up coming to, so I ended up coming to New York. I came here for a month. And um, Seattle's awesome. It's very laid back. You can like go, on, in the same day, you can go skiing, snor like scuba diving, a kayaking and then grill a salmon. Um, but like trying to get people to do stuff is hard because you've got Amazon, you've got Microsoft, you've got Adobe, you've got Boeing, and all these people work kind of nine to five and then they go and grill salmon. And um, it's an awesome lifestyle. And so like, and then, you're, and then there's me being like, let's go set things on fire. And they're like, ah, got a kayak, man. <laughs> so, I came to New York, and like New York is where people will set things on fire, metaphorically. And I was like, you know, this is a, so I was like the only, one of the few video bloggers in, in Seattle, and I came here, and there was like Blip, and all these other super awesome startups, and all these people who were doing stupid things, and um, it was like, okay. I was here, I planned to just be here for a month, and then go back to Seattle, and I ended up being here for a month, and then going back to Seattle, putting everything I owned on the stoop, and moving here. And then I had to like find, in Seattle you have like room to have like a workshop. Like in New York City, the hardware geeks have like, if, if you're lucky and you're independent, you have like a closet and you like, okay, I'm gonna hack on hardware. And you like Tetris unlock the like closet of stuff, right? And then, um, so I ended up starting this thing called NYC Resistor with some friends. So NYC Resistor is a hardware collective in Brooklyn. You should come on Thursday nights, which are community open nights. It's really when everybody's there. And um, we, I, I was basically like, I need people to hack with, to do stuff with. In fact, if you want to start a company and you don't have co-founders, like, get your hardware together and go to NYC Resistor. And if it's worth something or it's interesting, like, people will want to like, help. And then you'll be like, OK, game on. Um, so I ended up starting a company with two, two friends. One of them, was, you know, I, I basically, I, did, I got into 3D printing. I interviewed somebody in 2006 for my video blog. Uh, Bathsheba Grossman, who's a super badass 3D model, modeler, like, artist. And then, is that like a timing thing? Am I out of time? 
Is that a microwave oven or? Oh, it's just the elevator. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah. So, so you connected with those guys and then you like just said, hey, it'd be great, I need to build it. So oh no, we thought it was a horrible idea. Um, I mean, this was a bad idea five years ago. I mean, one of the interesting things is if you want to get into something, you kind of can't do what's most recently possible. It's like, you have to, like, it's interesting. I was talking to the folks at CES, and, you know, we're in kind of the front of CES now, and it's 3D printing. Like, when we started, we were there for a couple years, and we were the only 3D printing company at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And now we're in the front, and we have like 30 companies around us doing the same thing, or similar things. And I'm cruising the back alleys of CES being like, ooh, what's going on here? And um, so I think as an entrepreneur, you, you kind of have to ride the wave. And right now, the wave is like, it's, it's, you know, we're surfing right now at MakerBot. And the other companies who are presenting tonight are starting to, like, they're like surfing. But if you jump on the wave too late, you're going to be like, when's the next wave coming? And sometimes it takes years for the next wave to come. So there's it's something funny. about, I mean, like drones have been interesting for the last three and a half, four years. You saw Chris Anderson start his drone company yep. three and a half years ago. And it's really just become, how many of you had drones? Just out of curiosity, like how many of you have drones? Only one. Okay, one. About five of you, six of you. It's a hard in New York. How many of you have 3D printers, just out of curiosity? Or, awesome. How many of you know somebody with a 3D printer and the people who have 3D printers are allowed to? Okay, so my goal this year is to get to 50% of the United States of America knows somebody with a 3D printer. Because we already know, most people know what 3D printing is now. That was like a big hurdle for us. But next one is like having access in a way like you know somebody who you can go and manipulate and get time on their machine. Actually, you know, yeah, I mean, while, while, while we're on the, on, on the topic, I mean, it's, it's, it truly is the interesting question about, the, about this market, right? So there's a, you know, there's like a report that goes out, like, you know, every, there's a new report every, every other week, but like the, the report of the week is a, like a Juniper report that says, you know, it's going to grow, uh, speaking of like consumer 3D printers, but, you know, it's going to be like a million a year in five years. It's currently, they say it's currently 44,000, it's going to go to a million. So, you know, nice growth, but if you think that, uh, you know, Apple probably shipped, uh, I don't know, 30 million iPhones in the last quarter, uh, you know, not exactly the same um, uh, level. So what, what, what do you think the, the, the holdup um, is? Uh, is that a question of price? Is it a question of education? Is it a question of app? Uh, you know, meanwhile, you're seeing that's uh, like the sort of Kickstarter of the, of the moment is, um, I think it's called the Micro, there's like 299. Um, uh, 3D printer, which uh, is just reaching sort of the three million dollar level. You know whether they can actually ship it or not is another question. Uh, but is that is that what it's going to take? Like a bunch of super cheap uh, 3D printers to get people to start using and liking? I mean, I think so. Like pro tip, like launch Kickstarter after you develop your product. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I've probably have, there's I've ordered tens of 3D printers on Kickstarter because I like to see. I like to encourage innovation. Um, and I've gotten two of them. Yeah. And they, neither of them worked. So, um, I mean, they look good. But, uh, and they would, like, I could make them work. But it's, 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 it's hard, like, hardware is hard for a reason, because it's, like, hard. Um, <laughs> so, uh, that was a many parted question. So, the, the, there's the Kickstarter part, and then there's the, like, what's. No, the, the, the question is, what, in your opinion, is going to take for the consumer 3D printer market to truly take off? So, um, it's interesting because I really started with this consumer thing and wanting to empower or, like ordinary people. And we get lots of that, but a lot of where we get traction is in the, in, in the places where people know about 3D printing, but it's been like they used to send out for it. So one of the cool things about a MakerBot is it compresses the innovation cycle. So it used to be when you wanted to come up with a product, you sent out for a prototype and it would take you like a couple weeks to get a prototype back and you spent a lot of time because you wanted to get it right because it was expensive and you'd get it back and you'd be like, oh, we need more rounded corners on this and then you'd do it again. And you could iterate like multiple times, you know, really multiple times in a year for a product. So a couple times. When you have a MakerBot, it takes a couple hours to get a prototype done. 
and so you can iterate multiple times a day. So we're seeing companies like Jet Propulsion Laboratories, like Lockheed Martin, like these, these companies that have to innovate to like do space exploration, and they're using MakerBots to accelerate their ability to get stuff done. And so that's kind of like, it turns out that's, even though we're making, it, it's my mission as a former teacher, I want, and my, I'm dedicated to providing creative tools for people. I'm, I have kind of two audiences. One is like people who use this in their work that are professionals, and the other one is people who are exploring the frontier. So then, you know, besides like the Lockheed Martin folks and those kind of people, there's also like, um, uh, there's like Casey Hallgren, who's in New York, who's a set designer who uses a, a bank of MakerBots in her closet to do set designs every night, and then, and then also has a side business selling dollhouse furniture. So, you know, it's one of those things where entrepreneurs use these things to accelerate, and then in the same way that big businesses are accelerating. Okay. Um. So it's a split market, which is really a pain in the butt. Yeah. In terms of marketing, just FYI, like <coughs> having yeah, two yeah. groups yeah. So, of people. So, so and to look into that, so your, your core target audience now, so I, you know, not, do not necessarily like the term, but it's sort of the prosumer, which is basically. <coughs> so, yeah, so we decided to basically go after this prosumer kind of target people who are use 3D printers professionally and can use them to just like kick ass and keep their job while everybody gets fired kind of people. Mm -hmm. um, and t tell us about uh, MakerBot uh, Academy, yeah. I guess. So is that, yeah. is that partly you know, your, your, your pass as a, as a teacher, or is that also sort of training the next generation of, of 3D printer user? So I grew up in 1980. How many of you had an, I'm old, how many of you had an Apple II Plus at some point in your life? Okay, you are my people. Um, an Apple II Plus was something that came out in 1977, believe it or not. It didn't take off till 1981 properly. And then it really took off to like 1987. This was a computer that you could have on your desktop and play games with. It was really the first, it was the first, you, know, you had the Atari 2600, was, which was kind of awesome, but very basic. And then you had, you know, the Apple II Plus, you could play like Wizardry and do, you could justify it by doing your homework on it. Um, so you, you see, what was your question? I should get around to it. <laughs> Academy. Oh, so I grew up with an Apple II Plus in my house at age nine. And for most people in the room who are younger than me, you probably grew up with a computer as just an ordinary part of the thing you did. How old are you? 42. Okay, I'm 41. When did you have your first computer? Uh, probably 12. Okay, so yeah. How did that change your life? Um, for the better. It was a little bit, you know, I grew up in France. It was a little more Did you have the like uh, tell a thingamajigger? Minitel. The Minitel? Minitel, yeah. Yeah. I don't know that I use it for the right type of use, but that's a separate <laughs> discussion. Um, yeah. So what I want to do with MakerBot Academy is give the next generation. I basically wish that I could send myself as a ten-year-old a MakerBot back in time. That would be. That would make me so happy if I could have grown up with a MakerBot. And so for me, MakerBot Academy, and I put, I put a lot of my own personal money into putting, we've got more than a thousand MakerBots in public schools right now. Um, it's all about getting access to, to young people because if you grew up a computer nerd, I was basically exercise, you know, it was, I was the nerd and it was not a good thing to be in 1981, 1985 to 1985. If, there are, the nerds of today are actually the hardware nerds. If you're a kid who likes to use their hand, your, your well, hands, um, then you are, you are a weirdo today. If you, are, if you are a kid who, whether you're a boy or girl, whether you wanna make things with your hands, whether you wanna create things, whether you wanna play, if you wanna play with Arduinos, if you wanna do all this kind of stuff, you are the freak show. And I believe strongly that the freak shows are our future, that the, the kids who are ostracized are the ones who are the most important to give them the tools that they need. So with MakerBot Academy, we're on a mission to put a MakerBot in every school in the United States of America. And we're about 1% there, which I'm proud of. Um, there's a lot of schools. 
And it's powerful. I mean, we have kids who were born without fingers who are using this, the MakerBots at their school to, to print out prosthetic hands. We have kids who are doing their homework on MakerBots. We have teachers who are teaching kids about um, erosion by having all the students in the classroom make beautiful little 3D models of houses and then washing them down a river. <laughs> um, so when we think about the future, I, my goal is like a MakerBot is a, is a manufacturing education in a box. When you get one, you basically have to learn about supply chain. You have to learn about uh, like, and if you're, and like it's so great to see like literally kids get these and they're like, they immediately make phone cases with their school mascot on it and start making money. It's awesome. And um, so I could go on and on about MakerBot Academy, but it's, if you know of a, of a teacher who would get, get into having a 3D printer in their classroom, have, have them go to donorschoose.org and set up a campaign so that their community and me can help them, help them get a MakerBot in their classroom. And if you know anybody who wants to be a, a funder and fund these kind of things, connect them with me at Bree at MakerBot.com or at Bree on Twitter and we'll help them empower the next generation to kick ass. Last question from me and then I'll open it up to you guys. Uh, so get, switching back to the entrepreneurial stuff, what was really hard about building MakerBot? So my problem was that every year I thought, if we do really good, we'll double. And so I would plan to double. For the first like three and a half years, I planned to double every year. And after three and a half years, after tripling every year, I realized like, screw it, we're just gonna go 10x. Um, and so having to scale faster than you are prepared to scale, even if it's aggressive, is hard. So last year we grew from 160 people. On you know, January 1, 2013, we were 160 people. And then right now we just passed the 500 person mark. So I don't, if, you've, how many, if you've been in, in, in businesses, so I was, at, I was at Etsy from about 10 to 60 people. And I saw like three major like, major like change, organizational changes. And then I grew a company from three people to 500 people. There's just, you're really like, you really like start the company over a couple times in the, like in the last five years we've had to really, we've just been different companies as we've scaled to meet the demands and <coughs> figure out how to do this thing. And um, so it really started working when I, after three and a half years where we found our market, we got our niche, we, you know, we were in the kind of position where we never needed funding, so I was always able to make that, when I needed funding, it wasn't, like we didn't have to compromise. Um, what, what, what do you mean, because there was so much demand for this that you could just close around quickly or because you were cash flow positive? So like, um, so we did, our, we raised 75K from friends and we did about $8 million of revenue on that 75K. Uh, you say kind of comprehend a business like this that makes money? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's this, it's this crazy business model where you sell things. Um, no. Yeah, no, it's really silly. I should have just gone into software. Um, so much easier to scale. So many other problems, but yeah. Um, but eight million. Eight so, and after about two or three million dollars, we actually went out, I went out and raised a million bucks, 1.2 from Angels. And I talked to a couple VCs and they were basically like, yeah, we'll give you, you know, I needed to, I wanted to raise a million bucks. And one of the things I didn't realize is that no matter who you talk to in the VC world, whatever you want, they want 20% for that. So they were like, yeah, we'll get, we'll give you a million dollars on five. And I was like, no, I want it on 10. That's the deal. And they were like, no, we'll give it to you on five. And then I met um, really awesome angel in town, Shauna Fisher with Highline who was basically like, oh, the VCs will give you that? Okay, yeah. I'll put in 250K on a $10 million valuation. And, you raise in. and then as soon as she did it, immediately all the other angels and VCs were like, can we please get in? <laughs> Fine. And, and so it was like, okay, there's, some there's, there's all this weird validation stuff that you have to go through when you're dealing with. And it's probably different. This is like five, four and a half, four years ago and then there's like AngelList, which is like, yeah, like insert brand name, new company. I don't know how it works, honestly, but it's crazy. <laughs> and um, so 
we raised 1.2, and then I went out to go raise t $10 million, mostly because we, th we thought we might need $5 million to, to actually launch the 3D printers we just launched, the MakerBot Replicator Mini, the MakerBot Replicator, and the MakerBot Replicator Z18. And um, we thought, yeah, we could probably do this with a million, but let's be generous and go for five. And I'm like, I already learned my lesson with 1.2. We're, we're raising more than we need because we, we will need it. So we went out to raise 10, and it was the same kind of thing where literally the VCs said, okay, um, we'll give you 10 on 30. And I was like, no, I want 10 on 40. And they were like, no. And then I was like, yes. <laughs> and like three and a half months later, it, it worked out. And it was, but that was only because we actually didn't necessarily need it. We could have kept on growing organically. I just wanted to accelerate and be able to have extra extra cash on hand to be able to shoot ourselves in the foot a couple times which yeah which, which we did absolutely yeah shut up here uh questions in the back so we only have one mic right all right so i'll run okay Um, Evan Beard, A-plus. You mentioned oh, cool. NYC Resistor. What yeah. other ways people can get into the hardware scene or kind of learn more about hardware if you want to build hardware company? You know, I would say just uh, get an Arduino and learn Arduino code, frankly. Like, pretty much anything you want to build, you can probably do with an Arduino. MakerBot ran on modified Arduinos for three and a half years until it didn't work, until we we literally, for the last three years, used up every single bit in an in a Atmel chip. Like every single one. We couldn't add features for the last three years because it was like we used everything. Um, but basically, yeah, I would basically say get an Arduino and do and have bad ideas and explore the possibilities. Uh, and, and then I guess the other thing is just like um, publish. Just like do things and publish. Because you're going to learn a lot about whether or not it's a good idea by just publishing. So, yeah. So, uh, my name is Daniel from US and I. Um, so it must feel great to get yourself validated because all these 3D printing companies started. Uh, I remember one of the shows early on where you were the, um, I think three of the students were the only ones in the show doing that. But the market is getting crowded now. Uh, people have been coming up with many different varieties of 3D printers. I can tell you I, how, how, how we play the game, and that's vertical integration, owning the whole stack. So we, um, so like two and a half, so we use a material called MakerBot PLA filament that's made, it's a renewable bioplastic derived from corn. And when there was a corn scare, I bought all of it. I just was like literally like buy all of it. So that's like, it turned out to be like six semi trucks full of small pellets. And we were okay. It turns out that it bounced right back and it wasn't critical, but it was one of, it, to kind of give you an idea of that. And then I think, you know, the thing that's sort of our um, special secret weapon is we have this great community at, at Thingiverse.com where there are hundreds of thousands of models and people share them for free. We're not going to monetize it. We're committed to empower, uh, empowering people to have a place where we, they can share their models, get a spotlight. And, and Gadget and Gizmodo and Wired and all these places cruise Thingiverse every day for the latest cool projects. And the people who are using Thingiverse get to just like get a lot of really cool attention and get started. Um, and it's really a place where people can set their passions free. So I think, and we did that, and it's not a good idea to do it. Like we, like my AWS bill is like out of control at this point. Like, there is something like uh, 100 gigs of, of, of just models on Thingiverse. And um, <clears throat> they get downloaded <laughs> like a, a lot. And, um, and, we're, and it's agnostic. Like all of our competitors can use Thingiverse too. Um, and we have like 200 knockoffs. So, and like most of them look exactly like our 3D printer. But like 
We know about them because their users call us for customer support. So, because <clears throat> we have awesome customer support. Um, so, uh, and then, so I'm, I, and also I just like making, like one of my, so I have a number of like psychosis, and one of them is I just want to make people happy. And specifically, I want to make people who, have ma who use MakerBots happy. And um, so we do things that are probably not the best business sense, but that make us, ha make us happy to make other people happy. Um, and so, you know, in terms of it is getting frothy, like, you know, there is a 3D printer that just showed up for $300 that just sold 10,000 3D printers in, in like a week. But at the same time, I've, I know that 3D printer, I know what it took to build it, I know what the bill of materials is it, and they're fucked. So, um, I mean, maybe they'll, I mean, I actually, if there's innovation in it, I hope they win. I, I'm pretty confident that they're just selling at cost to see what happens, and I've seen that happen time after time. So, are, is there a possibility that somebody will come out with a better 3D printer? Absolutely. Do I, do I, am I totally paranoid about that? Absolutely. Do I, feed, do, do I sort of battle that paranoia by just trying to make the most easy to use, friendly, powerful product in the entire universe? Yes. So, um, that's, I, I guess that's just my strategy, is just make it, make it easy. Sure, bring it on. Hey, bring uh, oh, Sam hey. from Octopart here. Um, you Octopart, you all rule. <laughs> Octopart is this, so can you give a little pitch real quick? Sure, um, so Octopart is a search engine for electronic components. So if you're looking for semiconductor chips, capacitors, resistors, we can help you find best place to buy them, find a place to have them in stock, especially hard to find parts, uh, check out octopart.com. Thanks, awesome. uh, thanks for teaming me up. I still wear your t-shirt. Awesome. Um, my question is uh, about a comment you made about your audience. It's kind of split between the maker hobbyist community yeah. and the professional uh, users at like Lockheed. Um, we have a similar uh, yeah. split. Like, and I was wondering if you had any insight about how you've approached that on the marketing or the product side. It's weird when you have, when you have a, when you, I mean, I don't, unfortunately. I mean, it's basically like, a, you basically have to have multiple personality disorders to do it right, right? You know, you have to, you have to be able to, you have to be able to speak to the professionals while encouraging people who've never heard of it and explaining it to people who haven't heard it before. It's really, um, it's very tricky. I mean, we ended up doing it by literally splitting our product line. You know, we have our small uh, 3D printer that's still full of all this, it's got the same electronics as all of them. So it's a professional level 3D printer, same extruder, same camera, same electronics, same user interface, same software, different size, that we're kind of exploring the frontier of what it'll be like when consumers start buying this. I mean, may, we've been going, we went after makers first and then prosumers second and professionals third. And now we're exploring this idea of the consumer. And these people shop at Walmart and do crazy things like generate credit card debt. And, and are like, or, like ordinary people are super weird to hardware geeks. They're just like, they buy things for reasons we don't understand. Um, so it's really, like, I, I, I think it's, I think splitting it up is like the heart, like it's one of the things that, um, you know, we basically break it down, and we the way we work it out is we basically say, we're out to empower individuals by putting a MakerBot on their desk. And that's whether you're a, ma you're a maker, you're a consumer, you're a prosumer, you're, you're a professional organization. Like, we're selling like hundreds of MakerBots that go into a room and get networked and managed by a couple people. So we've got all this different kind of stuff. That's like one of the options, MakerBot Innovation Labs. Um, so it's, we basically said like, okay, we're gonna focus on just like individuals who need solutions and, and that's where we went. And that seems to be working, but I have to say like, it's still like, we're still at the beginning 
And I think like that's that's one of the things like it's kind of like it's it's probably in if we're looking at like the development of the computer and its evolution, we're like 1982 or 1983 in in computer years. Like definitely, like video games exist in sort of the equivalent of video games exist in 3D printing. We've got VisiCalc type <laughs> applications existing in terms of the prototyping and direct digital manufacturing where people are making parts that go on like flight hardware and stuff like that. Um, I, he's going to cut me off, but this is like, it's super challenging to have multiple, multiple different target audiences, I guess is my answer. Yeah. We can talk more about that. I'm, yeah. Okay, terrific. We have one last super interesting uh, presentation by Peter Simaha from Bubble Labs. I want to make time for this, but thank you so, so much. This was a fun and Thanks so much.